It's the laugh of cynicism. And a lot of the body of Christ has a lot of this laughter going on. It's the only way we can sit under faith teaching week in and week out and never let it really impact our lives. It's because on the inside, we laugh. We don't really think that promise is going to come to pass when it comes to giving. We don't really think that promise is going to come to pass if it comes to serving. We don't really, we laugh like Sarah did. And then the Lord, the Bible goes on and says, And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? I'm sure many Sundays after church, God's thinking, why are you laughing? Why are you cynical? Why are you full of doubt and unbelief? I gave you my promise. Why don't you test me? And it says, why did Sarah laugh saying, shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? And then the Lord says, and I think he's here to remind us of this tonight. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And then I want you to see this. At the appointed time, everyone say appointed time. Not her due date. She was 65. Sweetheart, there was no due dates. There was no IVF program here. She was beyond childbearing. But the Lord said at the appointed time, I'll return to you. According to the time of life and Sarah will have a son. See, I think many things that God wants to do in our life, He waits till it's past the age so that we will know that it had nothing to do with us. So that we will know that our bodies were not able to make it happen. Our gift, our talent, our ability, our resources, our connections, our relationships. God's going to make sure that we're past the age. Then He's going to say, I'm going to give you this promise because He wants us to judge Him who promised to be faithful. Many of us at this point, she's not judging God faithful. She's looking at her body and she's looking at Abraham's body. She's looking at the natural circumstances and what's possible. And God says, I can't give you the promise yet because you're only operating within the realm of possibility. You are limiting me to the realm of possibility. So I couldn't give you the promise because the womb of your faith is not yet strong enough to carry the promise full term. If, I, if you conceive seed now, you'll abort the promise and you'll miscarry the promise. So Sarah, get back in the tent for another 25 years. Let some people hurt you. Let some people offend you. Go back in there and try to do a bit of life until you discover that people will let you down. Until you discover that something at work will let you down. Until you discover Wall Street will let you down. Until you discover that the systems of this world will let you down. Get back in the tent until you get to a place where you judge Him who promised to be faithful. It's God. And so she goes back in for 13 years. And then for 13 years, not only has not God done it in her time frame, but then... He's not done it how she thought it should happen. And that's the second reason why many of us give up on the promise because God doesn't do it how we think he should. And when God doesn't do it how we think he should, we start to get involved in the process and say, God, I'll help you. I see this all the time, 15 years of youth ministry. I've seen young women believe God for the right partner. And when at 22, they think, oh my gosh, I haven't met him yet. God, I'm going to give you one more week. And if I don't meet him at church next week, I'm going to go to the nightclub. And and God, I'm not going to come to church anymore. It's like you're twisting God's arm behind his back. And he's like, I'm so scared. I'm so scared that you're going to go to the nightclub to find someone. Wow, I'm nervous. God, I've tithed once and I'm not a millionaire next week. And if you don't do it again, I'm not going to tithe next week. And God's like, knock yourself out. Gee, you're scaring me. But that's what we do. We don't like, so we think, God, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to make this happen. So Sarah's looking at this, and now we're 13 years on from the promise. She's now 78. At 78, this is what she does. If you want to put on, sorry, the next scripture, Genesis 18, 10 to 14. Uh, No, you're probably right, and I'm wrong. No, not 2 Peter. Keep going. I've just gone out of order for these guys. It's okay. We look slick, but we're not. Genesis 16, 1 to 4. I've just skipped a whole lot because of time. The Bible says, now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had born, had born no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abraham, see now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. This is what happens. When God doesn't do it how we want or in our time frame, we start to say that God's a liar. So the same God that said, I'm going to give you a child, we now say, well, you know, God hasn't let this happen. You know, God doesn't want this to happen. You know, God has just, and we start erroneous theology and we start changing the nature of char- and character of God to fit in with our experience because we don't judge him who is faithful. And so it goes on and she says to him, please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain 
children by her. I mean, I don't know what this woman was smoking, but I don't know any married woman that's going to say to her husband, please go in to my maid and have a good night. I'm telling you, Abram's thinking, okay, sweetheart, I'll do whatever you say. Ever since the Garden of Eden, the man's been going, okay, sweetheart, whatever you say, I'll eat the apple, I'll go to the maid. Anyway, all I'm saying (laughs) is when you start to try to do something your own way, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I'm going to jump to another church because it's not happening here and we start to try to control it. I'm going to start my own ministry. I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to pull my kids out of youth. I'm going to go and we just start to try to make happen in our own time and by our own method what God has an appointed time for if we would just stay and be faithful. If we would just stay and be faithful. And it goes on and says, And Abram heeded the voice. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid. You know, it goes on. And she basically gave birth to another son called Ishmael. And here we are on 9-11 in the year 2011. Don't tell me Ishmael's don't have consequences. So what we have to understand is that when we start to try to do something that's not in God's timing or that's not in God's method because we want it and we want it now and we want it how we want it, then you're not just impacting your life but you're impacting the generations to come and there's so many ministries churches businesses people that have given birth to Ishmael's in their life spiritually speaking because God never ordered it but people got out of the will of God and tried to make something happen in their own life now the good news is from this story that if you can get to the phase where you judge him who promised to be faithful It doesn't matter if you've made mistakes. God is the God of the second chance and God is the God of the third chance and God is the God of the fourth chance and God is the God of the fifth chance. And we see that come to pass here. But you know, there are times when we've just got to make a decision that even if God doesn't do it how we think he should do it, even if God doesn't operate, you know, the people that lead our A21 campaign in Greece, a pastor, husband and wife, They were pastors of a church, a small Pentecostal work in Greece, in the back of nowhere, for 20 years, in a country where it was illegal to proselytize, in a country where the biggest church is maybe 50 or 60 people, in a country where there's maybe 10,000 evangelical believers in a nation of 12 million. And so for them to even be born-again Christians is a big deal in that part of the world. Well, they had four children and um, were believing God and faithfully praying for revival for years and seven years ago there at the time their youngest son Peter was diagnosed with leukemia now these were people of faith in fact they brought the word of faith into Greece brother Copeland brother Hagen the whole word of faith teaching strong strong faith people and um, he was diagnosed with cancer and they so believed God for his healing so believed God and did everything naturally speaking and their son Peter in that time, found a DVD of this church that they knew nothing about called Hillsong, and they found a DVD of a Hillsong United group. And so he got all those DVDs and he would watch Hillsong United worship and thousands of young people and arenas full of young people. And he would weep and his family would weep and they would pray and they would have hours of intercession and prayer, believing God that what they saw on that screen, they would one day see in their nation. One day God would have mercy on their nation and revival would hit the land. And that somehow in God's timing, they would connect with this church that they saw. And here they are, this little work in the back of Thessaloniki, in the backside of the desert, believing God. Well, a year after that, six years ago, Peter died. And um, his pastors, his parents, faithful pastors for years, Believing God brought the word of faith in. Well, here is the promise who they thought their son was going to lead a youth revival in the nation. And in the natural, their son died. Now, God kept his word in that when Peter stepped out of this life into the next, God instantly healed his body. There's no issue about God healing him. God healed him. We're not a product of time. We're a product of eternity. God has plucked us out of eternity. He's positioned us in time. This isn't the real thing. This is the thing that's going to pass away. So Peter stepped in. So God fulfilled his promise. Now that didn't change the pain or the heartache on this side of eternity for his family. As a mother of two children, I could not think of anything 
couldn't think of anything more heartbreaking than to have to bury a child. And so she's, they're at the funeral of their son, 